Welcome to this Chronos session by Imagination Technologies focused on ray tracing. In this session, I'll be focusing on some of the ray tracing efficiency improvements that Imagination has developed over the years to enable real-time ray tracing on mobile devices. Imagination is actually one of the ray tracing pioneers. We've been working on real-time hybrid ray tracing solutions since 2014. We actually developed a test chip called Plato, which we've used to do a lot of this prototyping. The hybrid ray tracing is really one of the key innovations that we developed at the time. So mixing traditional rasterized graphics together with hardware accelerated ray tracing. And really we've continued to use this hardware platform for a lot of fine tuning, not only of the hardware, but also the software algorithms. One of the key problems with ray tracing is the problem of coherency. As you can see illustrated, in ray tracing, we are really trying to mimic the behavior of rays, the way they bounce around a scene and an environment in the real world and interact with it. As you can see at the top level, a lot of rays can come in in a very coherent way and bounce across a perfect surface, such as a perfectly flat mirror, in a very coherent way, which makes a lot of the processing efficient. Unfortunately, a lot of the realism in the world comes from non-perfect surfaces. A lot of real materials are very rough and they cause diffuse effects. And it means that rays that can come in in a very coherent way actually bounce back into the scene in a very divergent way. Now, divergence is not something that GPUs in their processing appreciate because most GPUs are built around very parallel processing architectures, such as a SIMD or a SIMT architecture. That really means that they are not very good with dealing with that divergence in execution, but also not very good in dealing with divergence in memory and data access. Because as you can imagine, as these arrays bounce around the scene, they hit different objects. As they hit different objects, you have to execute different shader programs. That kind of branching-like behavior does not work very well. Similar as these arrays process through a scene hierarchy of, of, of kind of volumetric representation of the scene, they hit different boxes and triangles. And in that processing, they access different data. Again, that's not very effective for a GPU to have that kind of divergence in memory access. So really to solve all these problems, we created a coherency sorting engine. And we believe it's really essential to have those kind of advanced techniques within the hardware to make ray tracing a reality in mobile devices with ultimate power efficiency. A lot of information about this problem and the solutions to it can be found in the white paper that is listed at the bottom of the slide here. To really help customers and developers understand the differences in ray tracing, we created a ray tracing level system. Again, you can see a link to the white paper at the top of the slide, but very fundamentally, all the way back in history, at the bottom of the slide, we had legacy solutions. These were lots of proprietary architectures, both from a hardware and a software point of view, which enabled accelerated and real-time ray tracing. The problem with non-standard APIs is that as a developer, you have to target each device specifically with proprietary software. And that's just not very effective for building an ecosystem. Luckily, Kronos has been working on standardization of ray tracing within the Vulkan API. And of course, that now enables a whole variety of standards-based uh, approaches to ray tracing, which you as a developer can take advantage of. At the moment in the market, we do see a usage of level one solution, which is the next step up, which is really to run software on traditional GPUs, or more specifically to execute ray tracing using compute programs on a GP GPU. Now, while this is very interesting as a kind of prototyping approach, it's really not suitable for mobile devices because this kind of compute, as just explained due to the divergence and the inefficiency in processing, and the fact that ray tracing is quite computationally expensive, would just not make sense on a mobile device. For that reason, lots of companies have been introducing dedicated hardware solutions. And that's really where level two kicks in. Level two is where we are introducing one of the most common processing elements in ray tracing in hardware, 
That is the actual testing of rays between the boxes in the hierarchy and the ray versus triangle testing. And of course, that already offloads a lot of the compute from the shader cores, but it also leaves a lot of inefficient compute within the shader cores themselves. So really, again, for mobile, this is not a very effective solution because it still loads a lot of the shader cores and it maintains all those divergence problems. A level three solution is really where we're offloading the full BVH processing from the software into dedicated hardware. Effectively, the shader or the kernel emits a ray. All the ray processing through the bounding volume hierarchy is done in dedicated hardware, dealing with some of the inefficiencies in that processing flow only to then return the results. The problem is this makes the ray processing more efficient in dedicated hardware, usually embracing MIMD concepts, which are quite expensive in silicon area, but it doesn't solve the memory coherency problems. You continue to process rays as they come in. And that is really where the level four solution, the BVH processing with coherency sort in hardware from imagination comes in. Rather than processing rays as they come in, we look at the collection of rays and we spot coherent rays within that whole soup of rays that is really processing throughout the scene. So we can bundle those rays in groups such that they are accessing similar parts of the BVH structure and increase the likelihood of hitting the same objects. In many ways, this sorting of coherency is very similar to the tile-based rendering where you are sorting and effectively processing objects within each tile. So really coherency sorting for ray tracing is the equivalent of tile-based rendering that is very predominant in the market for efficiency reasons. So level four is really where the processing efficiency for mobile real-time ray tracing is. The level five that we are anticipating relates to a different part of the ray tracing, and that is the building of the acceleration structures. In Plato, we actually had dedicated hardware for this, but in the current uh, processing in the market that we see, there's not really a need for this yet, but we have a lot of the technology to enable that in the future. So ray tracing integration is something that we did in our C-series architecture. And at the top of the slide, you can see some of our naming strategies. So in its name, CXT, XT is the higher end of our architecture, uh, and the C letter is there really the generation that you see there. The second number is our texturing rate. So it really controls how much texturing, how much bilinear filtering you can do. In this case, you see 48 bilinear samples per clock. The second number is the floating point processing rate. It's the amount of compute capability of the hardware. So how many floating point operations we can do per clock cycle. And then finally, you see the ray tracing uh, amount, ray tracing level three here. So three ray acceleration clusters. And the racks or the ray acceleration clusters, as you see them, are really the building block that offloads all that ray processing from our hardware. You can see the kind of base structure of our GPU kind of split into scalable processing units, which are kind of the smallest building blocks of our GPUs, and we can replicate that structure to build higher performance. You can see two of our ALU engines, which shared between them the ray tracing unit. Each ALU also has its own texturing unit that is coupled to it, and again, an SPU is made complete by all the fixed function hardware that we have. So things like geometry acceleration, so tiling engines, but also rasterization, things like hidden surface removal, iterators, etc. All of this forms a base building block that we then replicate to target our performance levels. At the top level, of course, you would have the bus interfaces, MMUs, caches, compression, decompression, as well as a firmware processor, which really helps us to deal with a lot of the dynamics within the GPU. So quite a traditional approach, but a very scalable IP solution to address a lot of different needs within the market. But the aim of this session was to look at the ray tracing. The photon architecture, which is really the technology behind our ray acceleration cluster, or RAC for short, is where all the ray tracing magic happens. 
And as I mentioned, there's a number of building blocks there that we can map back to the different levels in ray tracing acceleration. First called out here is really um, the number of ray processing units. So the ray box tester unit, which performs the intersections between the rays and the different levels of the bounding hierarchy, which uses bounding boxes. There's also a dedicated block for the box and the triangle testing. And finally, there's a procedural testing unit as well. So these are the grunt units which are doing most of the processing. You can see here that the box testing unit is much larger. And that's because as you process the bounding volume hierarchy, you will typically be processing a lot of bounding volumes in a hierarchical fashion before you hit the triangle tests. So relatively speaking, you need to do a lot more box tests than ray intersection tests. So of course, we use that difference in ratio to build the most optimal hardware. Now, if we would have stopped here, we would have had a level two solution, just offloading the box ray and the triangle ray testing in the scene. But as mentioned, that's not efficient enough. To create a level three solution, we need to offload the whole BVH walking. And that is really where a lot of the other blocks here come into play. You can see within that um, a scheduling unit, ray reference counters, a task scheduler, as well as dedicated storage. That storage will be important later on to give us the opportunity to rebundle rays and do the coherency sorting. But all the scheduling here is really about managing and driving that whole activity of taking an array and then processing it through the bounding volume hierarchy and finding the hit or the miss and then sending it back to the shader engines. And that's really the block that you see at the bottom. This is our interface towards the two ALU clusters that are feeding the ray tracing unit with requests for ray process. Of course, a lot of that dedicated storage on chip helps us to get very high efficiency in terms of the memory hierarchy and a lot of data reuse as well. Of course, the final magic, the level four, is the packet coherency gathering unit. This is really where in hardware, we will analyze all the active rays and we create groups or bundles of rays that follow similar paths in the scene and that are very likely to use the same data and hit the same kind of objects. And that really allows us within the ray tracing to deploy the same kind of parallelism techniques as the host GPU uses, the traditional rendering. So very parallel architecture. It's quite unique patented approach to this. And that is really what enables that level four of efficiency. And efficiency really in mobile devices translates to higher performance and higher throughput within a limited power budget. And that is really very critical for getting the best possible user experience in a mobile phone. And the great thing, this is hardware. So it's just like that tile-based rendering. It happens behind the scenes. You don't need to do anything special as a developer. All of this magic is happening behind the scenes and delivering you higher throughput and higher power efficiency. Now, of course, imagination as an IP provider is not just mobile centric. We are branching out into higher end markets as well. And that's what you can see here with our multi-core scaling. You can see that multiple of the GPUs are deployed, scaling up the performance to really the kind of entry to mid-level tablets uh, or entry level console solutions. You can also see here how the ray tracing can be combined with dedicated neural network AI processing cores to offload some of the efficiency of the processing, which can be very important in ray tracing, such as things like super resolution algorithms or denoising algorithms using neural network technology. And again, with all those fully loaded racks, there's a very high throughput that can be achieved with more than eight giga rays into a very, very efficient solution. And really looking at other solutions in the market, we believe we can deliver up to two and a half times more power efficiency for ray tracing workloads by using the coherency sorting. Of course, for developers, the standardization, as I mentioned, is very critical. That's really where we've been working with the Kronos group to enable full support for the Kronos APIs. That's both the ray tracing pipeline as well as the Ray query versions of the API. Equally as developers, how do you optimize, tune, 
understand the complexity of ray tracing. And that is really where a lot of our hardware-based profiling tools come in, such as PVR Tune. So really allowing you to dig into the scene and understand the efficiency of the hardware. So looking at the different loads for the triangle testers, box testers, the cache efficiency, the traversal and recursion, which occurs naturally within ray tracing. There's of course simulation layers for desktop emulation uh, under Vulkan as well, all available on our SDKs from our websites today. Now the visuals are always very important and there's a number of videos that are really highlighting the capabilities of ray tracing in the market. So things like the soft shadows that you can see within the scene, the diffuse reflections, the global illumination, and all of that can be combined with quite advanced resolution upscaling and super resolution techniques such as TAA and later. We often get asked what the visual difference really is with ray tracing. And this is quite a traditionally rendered scene. So using shadow maps, uh, and while it looks very impressive on a mobile device, you are emulating a lot of things. Shadow maps are not perfect and have a lot of tuning problems. Uh, as well as a lot of the reflections are done with simple cube maps. And you can pre-bake some of the information in there, but you can definitely not capture the whole complexity of the scene. Now with ray tracing, a lot of that becomes easy. The diffuse reflections, the much more realistic shadows, the fact that the character is being reflected within all the objects in the scene are really a lot of the things that are very complicated within rasterized graphics, but are really very simple to do with ray tracing. And it becomes a lot more efficient at that point because you're not spending hundreds of cycles of compute to try to approximate this. You can just do the spatial queries using the ray tracing hardware. But still this hardware, this kind of scene is missing something. And that is, it's really just using shadows and reflections with ray tracing. A lot of the real visual realism, however, comes from global illumination can really see that a lot of the very complex interactions between the light and the scene, the darkness, the light, the hidden objects that are really generating a lot of those effects, the realism jumps dramatically once you can enable global illumination in the scene. And global illumination is really firing a lot of rays in random directions. And that is really where a lot of the traditional hardware will suffer, but a lot of the coherency sorting will bring its value. It really allows you to adopt this kind of image qualities within the mobile uh, phone power budgets in the market. Thank you.